I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up. This has been a stormy summer for President Trump, mass shooting in El Paso, raising questions about whether his rhetoric inspires violence by white supremacists, that shooting in one in Dayton stirring up another push for more gun controls, and Trump's trade war with China may be doing more harm than good to the U.S. economy. With all those problems, do political damage to the president, or will they just fade away? I'll ask two New York Times colleagues. And we'll talk with New York Times deputy op-ed page editor Clay Risen about his terrific new book, The Crowded Hour. But we begin with the speaker of the New York City Council, Corey Johnson. The city's economy is booming, but that doesn't mean there aren't plenty of problems and challenges to deal with. The homeless situation seems to be getting worse, defying efforts to deal with it. The subways may be improving somewhat, but are still a frustrating mess for strap hangers. And the Housing Authority is widely considered to still be a disaster. All this with an absentee mayor running a campaign for president that's clearly going nowhere. De Blasio even got stuck in Iowa during a blackout. Let's talk about housing for a moment, a big issue facing the next mayor. Homelessness still stuck at near record levels. We talk about affordable housing, affordable to whom, how do we reconcile the need for greater density with people not wanting more high rises in their own backyards? How do we deal with rent control being challenged now constitutionally? A column by Errol Lewis in the Daily News saying, isn't this a good opportunity to re-examine the basis for it? Maybe you should have means tests for rent control. Throwing all of these things into the mix, what, if you were mayor, would you do differently to improve the housing situation? Well, we have a housing crisis and a homelessness crisis, and I think the foundation of that crisis in many ways is the affordability crisis that bedevils and I think is plaguing the city. You know, it's shocking that people learn that 20 percent of New Yorkers, one in five of the 8.6 million people who live in New York City, 20 percent are living below the federal poverty line. And when you go up to just above the federal poverty line, the number jumps to almost 40 percent. And so that is a lot of New Yorkers who are struggling to get by. And I think one of the biggest expenses that they deal with is being rent burdened, that the rent is too damn high, as Jimmy McMillan used to say. And so what we need to do is we need to build affordable housing. And as you said, Sam, the real question is affordable to who? When we talk about homelessness in New York City, tonight in the New York City shelter system, there'll be 58,000 New Yorkers, 58,000 that are sleeping in a city shelter. That doesn't include the number of unsheltered New Yorkers on the streets of New York City. So what we need to do is build truly affordable housing for low-income New Yorkers. We need to build supportive housing for people that are struggling with a mental health diagnosis or addiction. And we have to prevent homelessness to begin with by keeping people inside of their homes. Building affordable housing is very expensive because of construction costs in New York City. The more affordable, smarter way to handle this is to prevent homelessness preserve affordable housing, expand that affordable housing sock, and that is to be at the root and foundation of any good housing policy in New York City. We see empty storefronts all over the city. Is that just a natural consequence of the internet and other factors, or should we consider some form of commercial rent control? It's very, very complicated. I've spent a lot of time looking at this issue over the last year and a half, and I think it's geographic in some ways. There are certain parts of the city uh, that have rising rents and real estate values where landlords, I think, unfairly double, triple, quadruple the rent, and the mom and pop store can't make it. There are online retailers. There are property taxes that are funneled into the small businesses from the landlords. There's the commercial rent tax in Manhattan, which I think is an unfair tax to small businesses. There is uh, too many regulatory hurdles. So all of these things combined, I think, is what is causing a crisis for small businesses and a blighted, empty storefront landscape that we see. So uh, about two weeks ago, the city council passed a bill to actually get data on this, to track vacant storefronts across New York City so we can use that data to make informed public policy decisions. And we may have to consider that type of uh, policy in the future. Uh, but, you know, I think that's 
that's a measure of last resort. We need to get the information first to figure out how to tackle the, the There's issue. There's a national debate over gun control. I'm not sure how much more we could do in New York City to keep guns out from other places. But what do we do about another issue that is somewhat related, and that's cops and cabbies who are killing themselves? Well, you know, just this week we had the ninth NYPD suicide, uh, someone who died uh, by suicide, and we've had this with, uh, with cab drivers and Uber drivers as well. You know, mental health needs to be treated just like any other disease, just like cancer, uh, just like anything else, and there's such a stigma involved for so many individuals. And especially cops who know that if they, you know, turn themselves in or seek help, it could affect their careers. That's right, and you've seen the police commissioner, uh, Jimmy O'Neill, and the chief of the department, Terrence Monahan, go out and say, please come forward, we wanna get you help. You know, uh, mental, mental illness doesn't discriminate, uh, depression doesn't discriminate, and we need to make sure that these cops and cab drivers and all New Yorkers get the help that they need, and we're never, I think, really gonna be able to get to that point fully until we fundamentally destigmatize mental illness and fundamentally transform and restructure our healthcare delivery system, which locks so many people out, and it's hard to get the help in the care that they need. Brian Rosenthal has had a series of stories in the Times about taxi drivers and how difficult, he, how difficult they faced the transition with Uber and Lyft and all sorts of things. Uh, you have proposed uh, some remedies for the future. What about the cabbies who have gotten, you know, really lost lots of money in the past? Should there be some sort of bailout for them? I think we have to look at that. I, we, you likely couldn't do, and it would be uh, nearly impossible to do a full bailout. If you did a full bailout, it could be billions and billions of dollars, which the city doesn't have that money. But you could actually potentially restructure it in a way where certain folks, uh, you could give them a partial bailout if they, there was a, a lot of predatory lending and behavior involved. And so I think we have to look at that. Uh, there is a task force that has been convened to look at that right now. Brian Rosenthal's series was amazing. I learned a lot from it. This crisis has been going on a long time, and we have to stabilize this important industry and also make sure there are regulations in place that these predatory lenders can't do this again in the future. The mayor's gotten a lot of criticism for running for president. Is the city really running any worse because he's running? You know, I don't know. I mean, you, at the outset of our conversation today, you mentioned that we have some big problems. The subways, homelessness, public housing. Uh, Would all those be solved if you were here all the time? I'm not sure they would be solved, but they say uh, that in life, 90% of life is showing up. Well, 100% of being an elected official is showing up. And I think that's the biggest challenge for him in running for president, which is unlike the 23 or 24 other people running, he has more responsibility on a daily basis and probably all of them combined running the largest city in America. And so a few weeks ago, a helicopter crashed. He was here. He went to the scene in Midtown right away. And then a week later, there was the blackout that affected the west side of Manhattan, and he was in Waterloo, Iowa, and he wasn't here, and he got slammed for it. That is the challenge for any mayor to run for higher office. It is very hard to leave New York City. Very quickly, does that mean he has the most experience to be president? I mean, I think he has experience uh, running a big, complicated city, but we still have some big problems that need to get sorted out. And I am actually don't think that voters actually look at experience. I think voters want a captivating, inspiring message. They want authenticity. They want a happy warrior. They want someone who's joyful, and they want someone who can beat Donald Trump. Who is that? I'm not sure yet. I think uh, the medal will be tested over the next, you know, five months leading up to Iowa and New Hampshire. Thanks to Corey Johnson, the Speaker of the City Council. And up next, Trump's stormy summer, mass shootings, guns, immigration raids, a backfiring trade war. Will any of it stick? This serves as a very good deterrent. If people come into our country illegally, they're going out. The president doubling down in support of the immigration raids in Mississippi that took place the week of the El Paso mass shooting. Hundreds were arrested, many children left without their parents. Just one incident in a very bumpy political summer for Donald Trump. The mass shooting in El Paso raised questions about whether Trump's rhetoric about an immigrant invasion fires up white supremacists and inspires violence. Pressure building for red flag laws, background checks for gun buyers, even an assault weapons ban. 
A worsening trade war with China that's hurting American farmers more than it's pressuring China to change its economic policies. Plus, the president retweeting wild, baseless conspiracy theories. Will all these political firestorms stick and damage Trump, or will he continue to be Teflon Don? Jonathan Ellis is senior pol politics editor for The Times. Alex Burns, national political correspondent for The Times. Why are we seeing, at least by some measures, Trump, uh, his popularity seems to be increasing or at least not going down? Is that because there's such a giant Democratic field at this point and he's not running against anyone in particular? If you look at the historical pattern, Sam, President Trump's approval ratings have really stayed steady throughout his entire presidency. Uh, he seems to have a, a fairly significant floor because of his base, but he also seems to have a, a ceiling to how high his support can go in any particular cycle. So those approval ratings have been stuck in the low 40s for pretty much the entire time. But low 40s means he doesn't have to go too far to get to 51 percent. Alex, you're out in the country a lot with the Democratic candidates. Do you see any shifts at all? Well, it's not that far for him to get close to 50 percent. But remember, he didn't win with 50 percent last time. Right? But he won. And, and But he did win. So when we're looking at his sort of popularity, his political viability, uh, I don't think we have any reason to think he's suddenly going to become a much more popular president or a much more unpopular president, as, as Jonathan was saying. It's, it's been quite uh, stable in this narrow band of approval ratings almost since, uh, invariably, since the beginning of his term. The question is, can he get on the upper end of that band at the right moment when he's seeking re-election, because he really doesn't have uh, much room for error. And it is striking, I think, over the last couple of weeks, you have seen uh, as clearly as we have seen in his term as president that he's just not interested in reaching out to voters who may like some of his policies but be uncomfortable with his behavior or may be uncomfortable with uh, some aspects of his policies but generally prefer Republicans. He's essentially trusting either that those people will, will vote for him in the end as an alternative to Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden uh, or that they ultimately won't matter and all that matters is driving up his core support. But it's almost 15 months until the election. Uh, and we don't have a clear alternative. And the old saying, you can't beat something with nothing. Uh, what are the Democrats going to do? I mean, is there any uh, sense now as to whether they want someone who can be the best candidate, be the best president, uh, someone who can beat Trump? Uh, are we seeing any winnowing down of the field? Not much, uh, at least not in terms of candidates actually dropping out of the race, right? Uh, John Hickenlooper, the former governor of Colorado, uh, called it quits. Um, but other than that, people are pretty much forging ahead. Uh, when you do talk to Democratic voters, and this is reflected uh, in the polls and in the fundraising uh, as well, there is this group of candidates. Uh, it's, it's Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, to some extent, but clearly a lesser extent, uh, Pete Buttigieg, who are the people who are kind of top of mind for voters. I think everybody else, they've not been winnowed out of consideration, but they're going to need to do something pretty dramatic in order to put themselves at the same level as that group I just mentioned. And are the debates going to be the determining factor, and should they be? I mean, we look for some sort of metric, something... Uh, Quant qualitative to determine who's up and who's down. But, you know, the debates are one of those artificial measures, like how much money they raise, how they stand in the polls. Uh, there's nothing official about uh, how, you know, people get into the debates or not. They could still run, right? They could still run. The debates could provide uh, an important moment in the coming months. But they, it could also be the case that it really just needs to come down to the votes in the primaries next year. Uh, you know, the debates are, are showing how the different wings of the party are, are, are laying out their theories of the case. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be settled on the debate stage anytime soon. And is Joe Biden still the guy to beat? Absolutely. He's still, uh, by a pretty healthy margin, the leading candidate. Uh, in the field. And if you look at basically where everybody else is, um, he is pretty steady around the 30 percent mark. Most other people uh, are, you know, languishing in the single digits. And then you have uh, Bernie Sanders pretty flat in the mid-teens and Elizabeth Warren doing this steady climb, right? And so we have not yet seen 
Biden and Warren face to face in a debate. Personally, uh, if I were going to look to some kind of event in a debate stage to change or set the course of the race, um, that would be the confrontation I would look towards, uh, both because if she is ever going to catch up with him, it's probably going to need to happen as a result of some uh, direct contrast between the two of them. Uh, and if he is ever going to pretty decisively demonstrate that he is a, a guy who can uh, command the, if not the love, then at least the acceptance uh, of the left, um, he's going to need to get through that, that confrontation first. Domestic terrorism, immigration, are they having any impact on Trump's standing and on the Democratic race at all? They're definitely affecting what the candidates are talking about. That if you were uh, listening to Democratic candidates uh, a month ago or two months ago, um, it was overwhelmingly a conversation about their, pl their future plans for the economy. Uh, and now that's all definitely still there, especially for the more uh, left populist candidates. But for other candidates, folks uh, like Joe Biden, who's less, uh, less ideologically uh, clear candidate, uh, or other candidates like Cory Booker, Beto O'Rourke, uh, Julian Castro, um, they're talking about Trump and these issues all the time. And, and uh, so is Mitch McConnell, apparently, a little bit. Uh, is anything going to happen in Congress on these issues? Well, in terms of gun control, Mitch McConnell has said that uh, when, when the Senate returns after the August recess, he, he will uh, bring up that debate. Now, whether uh, he is willing to go uh, far in terms of uh, new gun control legislation remains to be seen. It, it certainly appears that, uh, based on our uh, White House correspondence reporting, that President Trump is interested in, in taking some action on gun control, but he has also uh, said those kinds of things in the past. After the Parkland shooting, they did ban bump stocks, but beyond that, a lot of that fell apart. One last question. Is there any sign of a challenger on the Republican side to Donald Trump? You have a couple people kicking around the idea. They're, they tend to be pretty uh, marginal characters. There is enough of a disaffected wing in the Republican Party that uh, I think we can assume that somebody like uh, Bill Weld, the former governor of Massachusetts, former uh, candidate for governor here in New York, uh, or Mark Sanford, the former governor of South Carolina, if he does run, that maybe there could be you know, 20 percent of the of the vote in some of these more moderate states, a place like New Hampshire that would not end up with President Trump. I think something really drastic would have to happen for it to become a competitive election. Jonathan Ellis, Alexander Burns of The New York Times, thank you for joining us. And up next, a superb new book by Times editor Clay Risen about Teddy Roosevelt, the Spanish-American War and America's emergence as a world power. Teddy Roosevelt is a huge looming figure in American history. His image is everywhere, from Mount Rushmore to outside of the Museum of Natural History on horseback. Leading the Rough Riders in the Spanish-American War put him in the national spotlight. But that war, which many historians think was unnecessary, also vaulted the U.S. onto the world stage as a global power and began the American century. Clay Risen is the deputy op-ed page editor of the New York Times. He's written a fascinating new book that puts that time period and its major players into perspective. It's called The Crowded Hour, Teddy Roosevelt, The Rough Riders, and the Dawn of the American Century. Candace Millard in The Times said it's fast-paced, carefully researched, and Clay is a gifted storyteller. What's interesting about this book especially is that Teddy Roosevelt is not necessarily the main character. It's chock full of other characters in this crowded hour. But the main character, as uh, the reviewer said, is really the brash young country. How does the country become the main character? Well, I think that the the thing that interested me most was the way that the Rough Riders as a unit, it's about 1,000 men at the beginning, as a whole represented the country. So the whole idea that America in 1898 would decide to go to war, uh, our first real foreign war, you know, we had fought Mexico, but this was the first time we went overseas and we chose to do it. Uh, it was something so weird in a way for, for America to do that. And yet you had this generation of people like Roosevelt and like these men who they'd grown up on stories of the Civil War, but then they'd also grown up in a country that was, was expanding rapidly and was suddenly sort of emerging as a, as a global 
phenomenon. And so it, it almost was both a war of choice and you know, an unnecessary war, and yet also in a certain way inevitable. And I think that that's kind of the attitude of the country embodied in these men. Did the Spanish sink the main? No. No, no, it was, uh, and even at the time, most people, most reasonable people recognized that there was probably unlikely, maybe sort of the, the uh, some of, you know, there was a range of ideas. Some people said, well, maybe there was a mine that was errant and it blew it up. The Spanish had no reason to blow up the main. I mean, it was, uh, there were negotiations going on. The Spanish did not want the U.S. to intervene. Uh, once the idea got around that the U.S., that the, the Spanish had sunk the main, it became inevitable that there would be a war. Uh, so it wasn't in there. And, and later on, there was some pretty careful research uh, in the 60s and 70s that went back and said, no, it was, it was an accident. So did Hearst and people like him really supply the war? <laughs> no, I think that the media story around it, and this is something I try to get into in the book, is, is a lot more complicated than that, where there certainly were people like Hearst and uh, Joseph Pulitzer and the, the kind of yellow press who definitely wanted a war, a war was good for business, ideologically they wanted a war, but what people were listening to were, there was actually a much deeper range of journalism out there, and some really amazing journalism. Some, even today, uh, looking back at it, it stands up. These were reporters who went and they would spend a month traveling around Cuba and then filing reports back that, that really were up to today's exacting standards, uh, but told a story that, that, that's really what persuaded Americans that they should go to war, that, that, that there was a genocide going on in Cuba, that the Spanish were never going to leave, and that the U.S. had a, a, ultimately a moral obligation to go to war. And one of the things you say in the book, Clay, is that it established the promise that American power would always promote not just American interests, but its values. But who determined what those values were? And how did, you know, how did we always know that we were going to be the good guys? Yeah, well, that's sort of the, the, the sort of complexity of it, right? I mean, that, and that's the ideology that, that emerged. I mean, I don't, I, th I think it's really important to understand that what emerged around the Spanish-American War was not uh, necessarily reflective of a deeper truth, but was this ideology that said America is uh, the, the reason why the reason why we can justify our wars is by this idea that we're always going to do it for good. Mm. And because it's an ideology, you can very easily get people to kind of agree on that, even if they ultimately have a lot of different motives for going to war. Uh, you said uh, in the book that you always start a new book and you've written a number of great books about spirits like single malt. You always start a book with a prayer. How come? With, with a prayer? A prayer. Well, I, I, it's a prayer that uh, the, the gods of the archives will look down on me. Um, and, and just, you know, it's, it's, it, no matter how much you spend on a book, it's always going to be uh, built on the work of other people. Uh, whether that's, uh, in the case of a, a work of history, it's, it's hoping that someone has done a really good job with archives and preserved materials uh, that you can then go to and work with. And, and often those people uh, don't get a, enough credit. And so I'm always uh, very eager to make sure that those folks uh, are recognized. I'm with you there. The, yeah. <laughs> the Crowded Hour, Teddy Roosevelt, The Rough Riders of the Dawn of the American Century by Clay Risen. I'll add my thoughts on CODA next. The 1619 Project in the New York Times and on nytimes.com is a painful reminder that 400 years after slavery began in America, its legacy endures. Subway cars and workplaces are more integrated. Restaurants, schools, theaters, private living rooms, less so. If blacks remain indelibly distinct to most American whites, at least our definition of racial superiority has become more inclusive. The president would bar Hispanic immigrants from mongrelizing our birthright. But barely a century ago, plenty of public figures considered any non-Nordic newcomer from any place but Northwestern Europe to be racially inferior. 
As Dan Okrent and Charles King remind us in two new books, the nativists were not only displaced Caucasian factory workers in the South and Midwest who burned crosses and hid behind white sheets. These were men like Madison Grant, who headed the New York Zoological Society, and whom Gunnar Myrtle would call the high priest of American racism, and Henry Fairfield Osborne, the president of the Museum of Natural History. The Times warned against admitting swarms of aliens. The Washington Post figured that fully 90% of Italian immigrants were, quote, the degenerate spawn of Asiatic hordes. Police Commissioner Theodore Bingham estimated that half the city's criminals were Russian Jews. Heredity, they argued, was destiny. Admitting Europe's wretched refuse would endanger indigenous Americans. Even Franz Boas, the Columbia anthropologist, took a page from their book to disprove them. Measuring the cephalic index, or skull size, of 18,000 children of recent immigrants, he found positive changes in those who were born in America compared to those who had immigrated from abroad. To Boas, though, it was all semantics, not science. In reality, he reminded us, Americans are immigrants in their own country. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.